somewhere in the crevices of a cloak, dipped in scattered pieces of gemstone and lie, are girls polishing their mantles, formulating opinions of good-for-nothing daddies who become bitter ex-boyfriends. Love steams from a black mother's crockpot, serenades hips into a dance, making white men's eyes bulge at midnight, only midnight. level of it it can mix it can cross but there's no actual collaboration as an equal in these spaces without anything you saying being taken as an affront to black men. And so the black power movement and all of those black civil rights movement, all these things, you know, had men at the forefront. I think the black women students were having a harder time from black men than they were having from the campus in general. And that was true for the society at large. If you know anything about uh, the Black Panther movement and things like that. Well, even the civil rights movement, you know the role black women played, but you also know how they were treated by, by, by others in the movement, in the Panthers. And there was a lot of that on campus at the time. in my tenure at Worcester it was either 
it must have been in 79-80, there was a women's studies conference that the GLCA held at Irwin College. It was an eye-opener for me. But one of the things I noticed was that almost all of the other GL GLCA schools had black women students at that conference. There were none from Worcester. And I said, why didn't you go? Why weren't you there? Why, why no interest? And they told me in no uncertain terms, they were not interested in women's studies, that the women's studies curriculum did not reflect their experiences, that they didn't see them anywhere in, in that discussion. And I thought to myself, oh my, this is an issue that really needs to be addressed. And it was at that point that I created my course on the black woman. I think that being black and female on Western's campus is really peculiar. There's a double consciousness that a lot of black females have to think about. And so one of the questions that I always think about is, what happens when black and female collide or intersect? What does that mean? I think that's, that question is always in the back of my mind. Um, I think the black women leave us always choose our race over our gender because of how prevalent race identity and racial groups are on this campus. So, in the 1970s and 1980s, black women experienced the same type of um, themes that have been recurring. But what changed was there were more of them. You would view things like, like there were a group of football players that would, you know, were just kind of racially, racially insensitive and would make comments. Um, and they always hung out together and sat together in the dining hall. And sometimes you would make a point not even to walk past their table because you didn't want, you know, them to make comments and that type of thing. It's the lack of diversity of black women faculty and administrators at predominantly white institutions that creates an environment that allows white male racist behavior to thrive. There were certain houses that you didn't go into because you just knew. You just knew. In passing stories of her and general vibes, I felt the groups on campus that are perceived as unwelcoming and are unwelcoming are almost always the white Greek organizations. I found that there was a lot of emphasis on white male Greek organizations like the Betas, but I found that the majority white girl or organizations are just as terrifying and unwelcoming. Personally, I purposely do not attend parties that aren't hosted by black or minority organizations, and sometimes I even avoid those. I do not trust the majority of white students on this campus after about 9 p.m., and especially after they have been drinking. I find interaction with them during these times to be unsafe and uncomfortable. After enduring the passively racist conversations held in the classroom, the obvious ways white students go out of their way to not have to touch me, um, the general denial of my presence and space, brushing rough lips against me, stepping in front of me, talking around me, and of course, the infamous white glance. I don't see any reason why I have to or should be a glut for punishment by attending their parties or spaces where they are the majority. This is especially true when liquor has been consumed, for it is then, again, that filters and guards are neglected, and I don't want to be around that white student when that happens. The increase in numbers of black women in white academic spaces, I'm sure, created this resentment, intensified resentment. It's coming over to get some notes from somebody and it was dusk. It was just starting to get dark outside. Pickup went by, the, all these guys hollering, nigger bitch, nigger bitch, nigger bitch. I mean, you know, I started kind of running to get to the house. Um, told my friend what happened. And she was like, oh yeah, that always happens. Yeah, we got to the point that we just tried to avoid even walking near Wayne, especially at night. But over the summer, I was staying here on the College of Worcester's campus and was walking down Bell, and I saw a young boy say the N-word out of his car. And I could tell that he had someone in his passenger seat. Um, and I could tell that it was 
it was like a truth or dare type thing um, because he like said it and like turned away quickly and laughed. Um, and it's interesting that even in the 1950s and the 1960s, when we assumed that all of this racism was going on blatantly, um, even then it was an argument that like, you know, black people weren't really experiencing racism when people weren't saying the N-word. And to see a young boy who appeared to be about 17 or 18 say the N-word in 2013 at the time um, just proves that, you know, this whole argument about a post-racial society is non-existent. Um, and there are still people in behind closed doors probably at the dinner table talking about niggas with their parents. There are still parents passing down hatred and t teaching these kids their racial slurs. So they go out on the street with their friends and they think it's okay to call somebody a nigger. Because the women who came before me articulated their painful experiences in higher education as students, I know how to create alternative experiences. And that's where women's studies comes in, that, and, and, and black studies, and black women's studies in particular, increase in the number of black women in white spaces, which then, I'm sure, precipitated a harder backlash, right, in that, and then you get, you know, then you get the affirmative action cases, um, you know, from Bakke in the 70s all the way up to um, Bollinger, and, you know, they're taking our spots. Right, so that's what's changed is that this idea of affirmative action after the 1960s increased the intensity of the assumption by, by white students, in fact, that black students didn't belong and they were taking up a space and they weren't as excellent. So th that's the, you know, the measure of continuity and change. Continuity was the, the types of themes based on assumptions of what a scholar is and that black women weren't. Uh, so that's the continuity. The change is uh, is the numbers, the increase in numbers of black women in white academic spaces. Most of the time I would participate, I remember getting into an argument with a very, very wealthy white male student in a political science course about affirmative action. Um, he apologized to me out in the hallway in Carroll Gay afterward. Uh, but I just... I can remember being so upset, I wasn't even sure if my argument was cogent. Mm -hmm. And then I was embarrassed because I thought, oh my gosh, I just, I let myself get emotional about this. I kind of got used to it later on, but initially it was kind of difficult. It was kind of difficult in that I was coming, like I said, from a majority black academic arena. And coming to Worcester, most, most classes, I was the only black student. Um, and then, you know, especially my freshman year, a lot of the professors were just, were insensitive. And they would say just some ridiculous things. I remember my first year, I think it was English comp. Um, and the professor says, she was talking or like doing some type of introductory comments. And she said, you know, some of you all might have some problems with this, cl in this class or you're in this class because of, and she looked, to a couple, looked at a couple of the foreign students and said, because English is your second language. And then she looked at me and said, and you because of black English. And I was taken aback, but because, you know, I was intimidated and I was a freshman and I was the only black student in the class, I didn't say anything. And I didn't really know anyone to say anything to. Still didn't, you know, which I probably should have, but I didn't address her or say anything to anybody or her about the comment. Because I, I think she said something else too. She, I, she was pretty awful. But, you know, I guess my response was I got a good grade in the class. Okay, so. Well, I've often been the only black person in the classroom. I took a lot of AP and honors courses in high school, so it wasn't unusual for me. But I think the difference about being the only black person in the class in Cincinnati versus at Worcester is that the people I was the only black person, like they've experienced black people before and they've experienced intelligent black people before. I was in Theodore Roosevelt's history class, second semester, with a professor who's no longer here. 
and we were learning about the expansion out west. And this professor turned to me and he said, can you tell me what the black perspective was on that? Which kind of struck me as a little bit funny because I wasn't around when Theodore Roosevelt was president. So I don't know, I, I personally don't have any feelings on it from the time. And then secondly, how like, am I supposed to give all of the black people's perspective? So. Perceptions of what it means to be a scholar and the historic definition of that being both white and male. And if you are neither white nor male, then all of the ways that scholars are, you know, that it's anticipated that you will be as a scholar, you start with an F and have to work your way up to an A, right? In terms of people's perception and sometimes our self-perception, right? It's not assumed that black women are fantastic scholars. My ex advisor was a married man with several children, and he was too busy for me. So I would turn in my pages that I would get done, 10 pages, 20 pages of time, chapters, and um, he wouldn't sit there and talk to me about them. I'll read them and get back with you. So it was getting late in that quarter, and I finally went and said, I need those back so I can make corrections. Well, I can't find them. He lost them. No, not, no computer backup. He said, well, can't you just write them over? So I had to rewrite my IS from scratch a second time without him checking it and making corrections for me. Oh, this is horrible. It was, I got it home, oh I didn't know it was this bad. Got it done though. It was awful. Sorry, she's. <laughs> no, I'm good. I, I didn't think I was going to cry about it's that. Okay. <laughs> I didn't think I'd get. I, it's okay. But it was terrible. So, I, I made it through. It, I passed the IS and everything. Being a theater and dance major here at Worcester has been probably the most. Probably one of the most like things that has ever brought me like heartache. And I say that because I went into the department with this label. And I never realized it until this year that this label has been on my forehead since I declared it as my major. And the label is African American girl who um, not even a woman. I said girl for a specific reason. Um, from Atlanta, Georgia, limited resources, lack of education, probably a single mother home, single parent household, which I did come from a single mother, and probably just didn't really have any guidance or didn't really know what she was doing. Was treated in such ways that you need to go to the writing center. All right, go to the writing center. Still not good enough. Okay, you need to go get a tutor or a mentor or let your peers read your papers. Did that and still didn't get anything. So it went from getting D's and C's from one professor consistently to now it's gotten to a point that I feel attacked by my department. And the reason I say attacked is because I feel like I cannot go into that building without leaving with tissue, use tissue in my pockets. Um, so going through GIS, GIS is a hard process for everyone because that's the first time you're using the word independent study. It's the first time that you're starting to do self-reflection and self-education on a topic that you want. Um, and I did that and mine was on the authentication of Slam poets and their audience members, specifically to the HBO series Brave New Voices. And I mean, that was fun for me. It was just fun because I started doing something that I wanted to do and realizing that I'm not a straightforward theater person, not traditional. I'm more of community based, what people already come with as nature, and just put it on a stage. And it got to a point that I just wasn't getting the grade right with my department. Not unusual, but I just kept pushing, kept pushing. And it got to a point that with one of the professors, 
uh, my advisor, meeting with that advisor every day, page by page, sentence by sentence, going over my junior IS. Turned it in, 28 pages, I'm good to go, I'm feeling good, I worked my butt off more than anyone else in my department because these people, some people will just forget about it for two weeks, pull an all-nighter, get an A, not for your price. I got to like continue to look at it, keep working. Get to the point with the end of the year, I don't get a grade. Um, okay, everyone else is excited about their grades. They got A's and B's, all right. So I guess my grade is coming. Um, we get to a point that we're actually at the end of the year, which is after commencement. I finally received my grade, and it was told to me that my grade was rewarded to me. It was a reward because I need to get to the next step, which is senior IS. Not saying that I am prepared for senior IS, not saying that I have done a good job, I've put in the effort. I'm rewarding you with this because you need to move on. I'm rewarding you with this because we need to get you out of the system. I'm rewarding with you with this because you need help. I'm rewarding you with this because you don't have any smart ideas. And that's a level of attack. Attack on the mind. It's the attack of this education system, that this institutionalized education system that seems to get people to a point and then drop them off to the side. And I refuse to get dropped off to the side. So I pressed on, brought this up to administration, and things, we kind of got to a point that this is where Bria needs to go. We did that, we keep going. One professor will come to me and say, um, I'm here for you. Another one will be like, I got you if you have any questions. But when I go to them, oh, I can't help you with that decision, that's your advisor. Okay, I'll go to my advisor. Oh, I can't help you with that because it's the department's decision. Okay, how do I get to the department? I'll bring it up. Not like like my advisor will bring it up. I can't go in the meeting to bring it up. And it was just like things just started getting torn down. Junior IS didn't do too great. They got to a point, oh Bria, because you didn't do great on that, we're taking away all your performances. So even if you try to audition, I'm going to tell all the directors, all the stage managers, all the other people who are involved in this process, Bria can't be in the show because of this. And I would not dare bring that, like, go put myself in that position that's putting me in a position of embarrassment. Mm -hmm. Because other people are knowing my business. I don't like when other people know my business in a negative light. Mm -hmm. And with my department, until now, thank God I'm not crying. Because I've mm -hmm. been so torn, like, torn apart, just peeled. Mm -hmm peel skin for skin, blood for blood, tear for tear, because I don't feel like I'm anything anymore. I've gotten to a point that I am just completing this assignment to get this degree. Because for some reason, getting a de degree from the College of Worcester is so prestigious, but there's this, this hump that you can't pass. So if you can't pass, then that's a failure. So I am, I am just trying to say, huh? Sorry, sorry, sorry. I'm just trying to stay like really, really strong to like keep <coughs> keep going because I've got to a point that no one believes in me, and we've got to a point that it's no, yeah, we're shooting fire for fire. Um, Cause now I've officially gotten. I'm telling you a lot. I've gotten <laughs> my advisor changed. But yet, they shot fire and fire with me that I got sanctioned for plagiarism for another class. So now my whole department is really against me. Nobody would look me in the face, nobody would look me in the eye. So this idea of this remedial student who actually stood up for herself it's being put back into the system under this label. And to take away something of like performing, for any person that believes in the arts is literally the worst thing you can do. Because that's that one thing that like motivates them. And when you don't have that, I feel like that's why I'm in this place that I am right now. Because I don't feel motivated to finish.
those who have had more difficulty, um, I've gotten a sense of maybe some isolation, um, particularly from their peers who don't haven't had interactions with people of color in the past. Uh, no, we understand that's just a dynamic of, of many places. And so um, not understanding then sometimes becomes othering, becomes marginalization, becomes loneliness on the part of um, black students, black female students on campus. So here's how I navigate code switching. Um, for example, si je parle dans une langue comme ça, tu ne peux pas me comprendre. Oui? It's, uh, so here's what I so here's what I just said in French. If I speak um, in a different language like this, you can't understand me, right? Basically, and so for me, code switching is literally the switching of languages. It's not. Um, I'm not being a different. <laughs> that was great. Oh, <laughs> you know how great that was. That was? <laughs> I'm not being a different person. I'm just speaking a different language because you won't be able to understand me if I don't speak your language. And so I learn these people's languages mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and then I communicate to them with the language that seems to be like their heart language, what they, what, what they sort of will receive the best. And in order for you to understand what I'm really going to say and not what um, you might think I might say based on the way that I say it and, or based on the way my mother might say it or something like that, I will say it the way that maybe you're accustomed to hearing it to help you because that's how you make translations. It was my junior year, I lived in, the, they had a black woman's house called Johnson House my junior year. And I lived in that house. It was supposed to be a support system for black women, an organization that provided support for women. Um, it was supposed to be an organization that allowed us to be able to talk and use each other as a sounding board when it came to issues on campus that we felt other people couldn't relate to, but we could relate to each other. And also the purpose of the organization was to be the mouthpiece for women on campus. You know, if there were issues that arose that directly affected black women, we were supposed to have a voice on campus regarding those issues. I do remember specifically, and I'm not sure if we, if BWO sponsored this event or if we did it like a co-sponsorship with BSA, but I'm pretty sure we just did it because we brought Shirley Ch Chisholm to campus. Anyway, we brought her to campus and she met with us, talked to us about political issues. She spoke on campus, of course, but then she also had a meeting with just the members of BWO and she ate dinner or lunch with us and um, just talk to us about women's issues and you know our responsibility and impacting um, or trying to once we graduate and trying to impact other women's lives. Um, she talked about what she went through and trying to get into politics as a black woman. So I remember that aspect of BWO. Now Part of the view. Sisters and Sisters are supportive of me by providing a listening ear and positive interaction and encouragement in an environment where that is lacking. We have a lot of fun. Now these circles can be annoying because they are in forms of clubs, so they're mandatory. Often I do not want to deal with the circle, but someone else might need it, so I have to be there to support them. Black women's experiences in terms of presence and challenges in the 1970s and 80s have not significantly changed from the 1850s and 60s because the public perception of black women has not significantly changed. Because I know it wasn't easy to do. There was always some name calling. There was always the, the issue of, not, of the campus not being truly inclusive. That is to say, to, to make them feel welcome. I don't mean to say there weren't efforts being made, but it's just probably a lack of understanding of what was needed or a lack of willingness to put resources into what was needed. And that probably still goes on. I'm saying I see color, I just don't care about the color of somebody's skin. And I think by using this like uh, colorblind, you know, this argument, it takes away from arguments that you, like you might feel like in class when you know you shared your story. Somebody could be like, "Oh, she's making this like a racial issue right now." When you're really not making it a racial issue, you're just like it is an issue. Like it's an issue that's happening, and it always becomes racialized because it should have been in the first place. Colorblind is false. Like 
everyone is a different color. The three of us are different colors, and the three of us experience are different. If I were to say all of our experiences are equal or that we're colored like it's false. Like, you know, you guys have experienced things that I haven't, I've experienced things that you haven't. And I just, you know, I think it really takes away from people's feelings and emotions and real issues by saying everyone is equal. I'm not saying that. I mean, yeah, color blind is post-racial, uh, post-blackness. Um, <clears throat> all of those are like rejections of the fact that we are still in a racist functioning society that functions on racism. And I used to believe that, like, you know, I don't see color. Um, until I got here and I was like, no, <laughs> you do see color. Um, Especially for black women, it's, it's extremely difficult. We have our gender against us and our race against us. And even black men could be our own perpetrator just because of that extra intersecting factor, the gender, the womanhood. Um, and I feel like e along with being colorblind, there are people who are blind to the fact that black women's experiences should be heard and are very, 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 very different um, from just black people in totality. But I feel like, as just like I was saying earlier, one way to kind of dismantle this whole perception of black women on campus is to speak for a speak out and say, no, 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 this is who I am, not what you see. Let me tell you, let me recreate, let me speak. In deciding how I react to things, I always think about the ancestors. If, if the ancestors ignored their enslavement, I'd still be in chains. So while individual responses may be to, initial responses may be to, I just can't deal with it, peace that's cool but uh the people who fought so that you could actually even get into the in these gates didn't ignore um, those conditions and so it's our social responsibility to not ignore not only to not ignore the conditions or pretend that we've made it but to continue to agitate and make it better for the next generation so it's, you know, it may be cool for you to ignore it, but if you're talking about social responsibility, then that involves, you know, putting your hand in the struggle and getting dirty. Existed, and I think in, in an age where um, we like to think that we're above these things, these messages aren't passed on early enough to help students develop or figure out potential coping mechanisms for when these 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 confrontations happened around sex or around race often at the intersection right so um, to the extent possible being educated about these issues is extremely important um, just knowing a you are not alone um, this has been going on since been going on and so you have an opportunity to, to know that other people have, have overcome or at least managed um, while, while going through school, while going through their job, while interacting with people. And racism and sexism hasn't gone away. Um, it, it, its faces are very different and diverse, but it's, it's absolutely here. I wonder who the first black woman who came to the College of Worcester was. Maybe if we knew her or knew more about her, we'd be more prepared for experiences here. Prepared for what? For feeling invisible. Do you feel invisible as a black female? Knowing the history of struggle is the key, right? Literacy and write. You read and write the stories of those who've come before because they tell you how not only to survive, but how to beat a racist system and to contribute anyway and have a joyful experience. Turner's grandmother, uh, Nina Turner's Ohio State Senator, said everything I have to say about success, which is there are three things you need, a wishbone, a jawbone, and a backbone a wishbone for goal setting, a jawbone for speaking out, that's that voice that we were talking about, and a backbone for perseverance, that's all you need.
It's only one word. I used to dance to that. Love is more than I require of thee. 